Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry. That was uh, an error on my mistake. You've all been waiting for ages. I actually didn't realize I had to press admit everyone. I thought I'd automated it. Oh, no. Can you please let me know if you can now see the presentation and hear me in the chat, please? How are we going? Can everyone see now? Yes. Oh, that sounds fantastic. And you can hear me. Hooray! Oh, I'm so sorry for that delayed um, delayed opening. We've all been waiting so long. Uh, we'll put that on technical issues that I thought I had going. <laughs> uh, thank you all very much, much for waiting. Uh, I'm glad to see that you're all here. I'll just admit everyone else who's poor things who've been waiting. And um, I'll get going with the presentation. Yay, looks like you can all hear me now and all see me. Fantastic, let me just double check before I delve into tonight's presentation. OK, looks like we're we're set to go. Thank you very much for waiting and let's get going because um, you've all been waiting a while. So I'm Rosalind Franklin. I'm the owner and director of Amalgamate. Thank you for joining me with tonight's webinar, Five Common Dental Sterilization Room Mistakes and What You Can Do About Them. Now that I've admitted everyone into the, the webinar, you've also probably worked out that your microphones and your videos have automatically been switched off. This is to minimize any background noise and any distractions, but you can type away in that chat function. And when we get to the Q&A at the end, um, please type any questions in there. I'll be happy to answer them as best I can. Let me just make sure there are no more questions in the chat function. Yes, excellent. Everyone's saying yes. Oh, phew. <laughs> oh, technology. Right. Before we get diving into this webinar topic, for those of you who haven't sort of met me or seen me before, um, I'll just quickly share a little bit about myself. I'm a graduate from the University of Western Australia way back in 1994 and then I practiced as a dentist in rural and well pretty much rural remote no not remote rural practices uh, for about 15 years um, I'm still in Western Australia um, I got to probably the 15 year mark and decided that I felt I would like to have a slight change in my career, pop down my tools and uh, work training dental assistants for three years, which was fantastic. Um, go dental assistants. And then I sort of fell into infection control by working with a practice I used to work as a dentist for. Uh, wanted me to come and help with their accreditation and infection control and that started me on that journey. But I quickly realized that my knowledge in infection prevention and control was not particularly, uh, well, I knew what to do chair side, but that magic room where the instruments go to, had no clue what went in there and, and quite a few other things. So off I trotted back to university, got some post-grad studies in infection prevention and control and I've also been quite involved with the Australasian College for Infection Prevention and Control. All right, let me just make sure there's no one else wanting to come in. Nope, that sounds great. Okay, everyone's still going okay. Fantastic. Moving on to tonight, um, I am going to talk about the five most common mistakes and how I can then perhaps help you if you are feeling overwhelmed, if I'm talking a foreign language, uh, and then we'll have the Q&A uh, at the end there. The Stary Room. It's the heart of our dental practice or the engine. Someone else is saying they're having a few issues. So let me just quickly Start again. No, I'm getting lots of 
happies. So um, we'll try in and out again. All right. Uh, anyway, this is recorded. So if something happens tonight, I will send it to you. So I was talking about the Stereo Room and I know it's an incredibly busy, busy room. I've seen so many different sizes from the slightly oversized room cupboard to a really small room to a much larger, you know, more space sort of room. And as you know, this is that mysterious room where our instruments and some of our equipment go to be cleaned and sterilized. And every dental practice should have a dedicated space room for all this to, to all this to happen. And I just wanted to sort of just quickly remind you that sterilization is more than just putting our instruments and some equipment or reusable medical devices, as we call them, through an autoclave. It's really part of a multi-step process. It includes cleaning, drying, inspecting our instruments, packaging them, labeling, then sterilizing, and then putting them appropriately away into storage to ensure that it's safe to reuse again. And this diagram shows you that it's a cyclic process and it's a continuous process. And one thing to also keep in mind is um, the pre-cleaning to the inspection stage. That's really designed to make sure we remove contaminants and most of the microbes. And then the sterilizer of the autoclave will kill what's left. So I know how busy this stereo room is. There's a constant influx of instruments. There's a it's dynamic, it's fast paced. And what I've tried to do is select five common issues that you can go, yeah, I think we do that and we can easily fix, or mm, I'm not sure if we do that, let me go back and check. And I wanted these to be quite simple, uh, straightforward and easy so that you can make these small changes and really enhance that sterilization process. Right, so test number, mistake number one, putting the Helix test in with that first load of reusable medical devices. So every day we need to run a couple of tests autoclave test to make sure that it's working properly. Now the first test that you may run will be your vacuum or leak test. And this is done when the chamber is cold. And what it does is it tests when the door is closed, the cycles, you know, press start, that it's making sure that no air leaks in or out of that chamber. And some brands of autoclave say, yes, we need to run this every day. And another brand might say, well, we have an air detector fitted, so you only need to do this once a week. So what you need to do is look at your autoclave's instructions for use and see what it says. But it's the second test that I think I want to really talk about. Uh, is there someone else ready trying to get in? There we go. So this second test is an air removal and steam penetration test. Quite a mouthful, isn't it? And this air removal steam penetration test is either a Helix test or a Bowie Dick test. So this test is required to be run every day in that order club, regardless of the brand. And what it does is it tests how well the air is removed from inside the chamber and from inside any instruments, which is done at the start of the autoclave cycle. And this test is one that you actually hold in your hand and you can visually check. So even if the machine says, yes, I ran the test and um, it's all fine, we actually need a visual check to make sure that it is happening. 
Now to help explain this topic a little bit further, I've got a little five minute snippet of a video I shot with Steve Lines from STS Group in Perth from my new online autoclave course. And this, um, I hope you find this interesting. Now the sound is probably a little faint, but there are subtitles. So let's hope this video works. what you put in, the testing equipment that you right. put in that might be slightly different. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So this particular one is a helix test, mm -hmm. which is really quite interesting. Um, and I noticed the tube here has one open end, one closed end. And I imagine when I unravel this, I think it's like 1.5. It is, yeah. 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 1.5 meters long, but it's, it's quite <laughs> a bit long in that, isn't it? What do you think about that? It's an incredible it's, challenge, isn't it? It's like, it's like, so. And it's narrow as it's well. What's the diameter there? I'm not sure. Three, four, three mils, four mils. Something like it's that. It's pretty narrow. So the idea is when this is placed inside and we run, we choose the Bodex slash Helix test, it's going to have to now suck the air out of this 1500 millimeter tube. And then uh, once it, the air is out, then it, when the steam comes in, the steam's got to go through here all the way to the end. Yeah. And the only way we can know that it makes it to the end is by putting one of these um, special little indicators in. And the indicator at the moment is yellow and purple. The purple will stay the same color, but we want yeah. the yellow strips to turn purple when the steam reaches it. So there's a special way to put them in, and you've got to make sure you read the manufacturer's instructions. So with this particular brand, is it yes, well, that way? Yeah, it is. And it's uh, the, the other end is closed yeah. end in. Yep. Yep. Got to read the instructions. <laughs> and then we just screw that back on top. That's right. Okay. And then this goes inside. Now your manufacturer would say, or the manufacturer of this device would probably tell you where inside to place it. Yeah. So normally I think it's in the middle? Yep, the, um, it, it's somewhere in the middle of the chamber is good. Um, each, each manufacturer will have what they call a cold spot within the machine. Uh -huh. But with the chamber this small, that cold spot, there are, it, it becomes very academic about the difference in temperature between any two places of the chamber. So if, if we were to say generally in the middle of the chamber, we're safe. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so for these small bench top ones, mm -hmm. generally, Cold spots. Yeah. A bit well, academic. Yeah. On this particular one, on, on, this, particular on this range, one? it's right here actually. Middle, front, centre. Alright. And and is that where you want to actually put your test kit? Uh, that's where we put uh, for when we're doing validation, for example, that's where we put the challenge pack, because it's the biggest pack within the coldest spot of the chamber. Yep. Um, and it might make sense to put the helix device there too, being the biggest challenge. You know, okay. Slightly colder than any other. So place. for this particular machine, I'll pop it there because that yep. seems to be it. Yeah, perfect. Now, can I put anything else in there? It's, that's an interesting question that I've often had because mm -hmm. often they'll put that in along with all the first load of instruments ready to go. But in fact, that's actually wrong. So if you read the Australian DE 4815 standard, this has to go into another load of empty chamber. Okay. Um, and the reason being is I've got this correct because the less items that are in there, there's more air in there, the harder there's more air to suck out. So okay. you want to make this as challenging as possible, don't you, for that device. So yeah. you want to have, if you shove it full of lots of instruments, there's mm. going to be less air. Yep. That's how I think about that. <laughs> no, it's exactly right, yeah. And even the helix test itself, the cycle, if we look at you know, if, you, if you actually look at the cycle on the record, it's only holding for three and a half minutes instead of four minutes like a sterilisation cycle okay. would. So we, we, what we're trying to do is give it worst case scenario when we're testing it with, um, you know, put the, put the helix device in the coldest part of the chamber with no other instruments in there that would be otherwise filling up that space. Um, and then running a cycle type that's 
not as long as a normal cycle. So if it passes under all of those conditions, we're doing it right. We're doing it right. Yeah. Yes. So with this particular one, it's a visual check. So once yes. it's come through, we can take this out and double check that the yellow strip has changed color. Yes. Um, and that's the visual check. Because, I mean, the machine can tell you that it worked properly. But right. We don't actually know how effective it was at sucking air out of 1.5 meters. Yeah. Tiny tubing, which is really supposed to sort of replicate the inside of hand pieces, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. the hand pieces are our instruments with small narrow tubes, and we want the air to be sucked out of the inside of them and steam to be yeah. put in to sterilize them properly. Yeah, so of that little snippet. Um, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that the sterilizer is empty. There's only the racks inside when you put your helix test in there. And most of you will be just be running the helix test because you'll be popping your hand pieces in there. The Bowie Dick test is a, sort of a piece of cardboard um, with a colored pattern on the top and that's designed for loads or in, things inside that are just porous like your drapes and gauzes and things like that so you find that your helix test is much more um, challenging and of course if you want to know where to place it you read your manufacturer's instructions I can see a few questions coming in about that and I'll come back to them at the Q&A at the end. So mistake number two, improper packaging of your RMDs is another common mistake that I've seen. And in these examples, I'm really just talking about your sterilization bags or your plastic paper pouches. And these are designed with the plastic on the one side and your special paper on the other side. And it's the paper that allows the steam to come through to the instruments and that heat is transferred and then kills those bugs that are on there. So improperly sealing the bags can actually compromise the sterility. And that's shown in the photo on the left. You can see that it's not been folded. Uh, there's a perforated line where you seal it. So when you fold it over, it's perfectly sort of half on the paper and half on the plastic and seals properly. So it then keeps, ster it's keeps sterile. The other thing I've often seen is the overstuffing of pouches. The let's just shove a bit more in there until the pouch is almost going to pop through the paper, but it's fine. This also um, is, is not quite right because you need the instruments to be in a single file and flat. So if I show you my next slide, just talking on the overpacking, what you want to do is have at least one finger width on both edges and all the instruments laying flat. And that way the steam can coat them evenly. And as I explained before, when you're folding these bags, um, make sure you fold along that dotted line so that there is a nice even seal. And that's something that I look at. So when if I go into order to practice, I will actually open drawers and I'll look at all these bags. I'll look at how well have they been sealed and are they still sterile? So moving on to a common mistake I see. Well, this was a this was a practice I was at, and she was about to load the order club with this um, quite impressive uh, stacking of bags. And um, yes, so I we I sort of um, said, ah, not not quite right. Uh, let's have a go. And I know it's so tempting to squeeze yet another bag on or let's just stack here and we'll overlap a bit more as you're sort of doing this little, you know, you're trying to fit everything on these rather small trays. But the trouble is, if you look at the manufacturer's instructions, they're really clear. It's single layer of everything. And that's because of the way our steam sterilizers work and the way the pouches work. 
So we need the pouches to be single layer so that the steam can cover completely. And when those bags, those bags actually go undergo quite an expansion when they're in the autoclave and you need them to be in a single layer so that nothing impedes that steam getting in. So kind of a think of it like your washing machine. You know how the, your washing machine, you might have bought a seven kilo and you can only really put seven kilos worth of stuff in there, maybe on the best or the cycle that it requires. Otherwise, one, it just doesn't clean the sheets well. Uh, the hot water can't get to all the sheets. And it's the same like that with your autoclave. It needs to, the steam inside is like that water and it needs to coat everything nicely. So here's how it should have looked. And boy, that's a lot less instruments, isn't it? But this is why if you have a practice with a lot of instruments and you're running one autoclave, you might need to consider looking at the instruments you're using and perhaps uh, increasing to add another autoclave just to purely put the instruments through properly so that they are sterilized properly. Now, another big question is paper up or paper down. This particular brand was very specific in its manufacturer's instructions that the paper goes down. But you might have a different brand, and I'm pretty sure it's the Lisa brand, tends to always say paper up. Though if you had, say, a Mocum, I know that's the other way around. So you need to once again read those manufacturer's instructions. So looking at um, number four. So here's some photos that I've taken in a practice. Um, and if I, if, is it common? Have you seen either loose instruments or some of your instruments inside the bag? They're still wet at the end of the cycle. And that's with the drying cycle. So this is called a wet pack. So there's moisture in that pack. It may be seen as dampness. It may be seen as droplets or puddles of water within the pack. And I've shown you in this photo on the left, drawn in red, to sort of show there's droplets um, that you probably can't see it quite so well with the syringe, but with the matrix band, you can sort of see it in the pack there. Now these wet packs, they're subject to wicking. This means that microbes can enter through that wet packaging and they recontaminate the instruments. And you also might find these wet packs will lead to some instrument corrosion. So what you don't want is wet packs at the end of the cycle. So let's say that's actually happened. Probably the main reason, one of the main reasons I've found in my experience is because the trays have been overloaded. They've just piled too much on there. There's a couple on top and it's just far too full and it just cannot dry properly. So if that happens, um, have a look, go back. OK, have I overloaded the trays? The manufacturer's instructions will tell you how what weight of instruments you can put in if you're not sure. All right, so if you say, OK, look, I'm confident we we didn't overload, um, there is possibly another cause. So look at your instructions, see what it says in that troubleshooting. Um, another thing, too, is were the instruments dry before they went into the autoclave? I know when dental assistants are rapidly trying to get things through, they'll do the fast dry and package things and everything's still wet and damp. It's really important that everything in there is dry because the water used in an autoclave cycle, for one, it's not good old tap water, it's filtered water, it's demineralized water, and you don't want to upset the balance of water that's in there. Um, it does seem to correlate from what I've seen. Have a look at the door seal, have a look at this, of course, in doubt, ring a technician. All right, let's, so let's say you've had a load and one pack is wet, but everything else is dry. Do you fail that entire load? 
know if there's one pack, everything else is bone dry, that wet pack needs to be taken out and cleaned and dried and bagged to go back through. But the rest of the load, if it's all dry, intact, indicators have changed, you can release that load. But if you have two or more wet packs, I wouldn't. You need to investigate the why. And those instruments, the load is deemed failed, need to go back through that cleaning packaging system again. The last one that I want to talk about is the good old ultrasonic cleaner. Uh, I'm sure just about every one of the stereo rooms will have one of these. And what's really important with this pretty amazing machine is that we do have to test that it's working. So like a helix or a Bowie Dick test, which is a visual check, once again, we do a test where we visually look. And an ultrasonic cleaner works by sending sound waves through the water, which then cleans or scrubs the instrument by the way of lots of microscopic vacuum bubbles. And these bubbles are created by transducers. They're fixed to the underside of the tank and they kind of look like two metal plates uh, with wires attached to like a circuit board. I pulled one apart to have a look because I was quite curious. And I've shown you a little diagram of a particular ultrasonic cleaner that has three transducers. Yours might only have two. So what we want to test is that those transducers are working properly. And many of our machines don't actually have a light or a gauge that says they are working properly. So this is when we do this, what they call a performance test. We check its ability to produce these bubbles. So there are two tests that you can use, and I'm referencing an Australian standard on ultrasonic cleaners here. There's the foil test and the pencil test. So the foil test involves placing strips of alfoil suspended over rods, or in this case, the photo, uh, good old bamboo skewers work really well. And you run the machine for 10 seconds. Now, this is after you have filled it, put your detergent in and degassed it. Then you do your test. After the 10 seconds is up, you take out each piece of foil and you're looking to see that there's little dancer holes sort of evenly spaced in all of the pieces. What you might find is one particular piece looks like it's been hardly touched, and that's an indication that one of the transducers isn't working. And that's when you put an out of order sign on it and you look at getting it repaired. Now, the other test that you can do is a pencil test. Um, this is a ceramic disc, a microscopic slide. You make a marking with a pencil, and once again, you pop it into the machine after you have filled it, added your detergent and degassed it. And normally you run it for about three minutes. And after three minutes is up, you pop your hand in and the machine is off and you pull it out and you should see no pencil mark. And that no pencil mark means it's good to go. Now, just to note with that alfoil test, Tiny bits and pieces of foil will be left in that tank because it's made little holes and you don't want those tiny bits sticking to any of your instruments. So this means once you've done this alfoil test, you really should empty the tank, clean it out, refill it, add your detergent and degas again. Now, that does take time. So often a good time to do this if you're using a foil test is just before you're going to um, change the solution. So if you're a busy dental practice, that might be mid morning or at lunchtime because that cleaner is more like a bath and that water and detergent needs to be changed quite regularly as soon as it becomes dirty. It's not going to be cleaning as effectively. And the other most important thing is, OK, you've done this test. Now you need to record it. Please record it. If I'm auditing your practice, that is one thing I'm going to be looking at. I'm going to be looking at your sterilization records because that's how I can track that an instrument has been through your process and I can track the process that it's been on. So it's as simple as the date, 
um, saying that yes, we put in the right uh, amount of solution, we degassed it, who did it, at what time, and for example, this was the pencil test. Tick, passed, who did it by time. You can either have it in an Excel spreadsheet, you can have it on a piece of paper on your cabinetry in a folder. Perhaps you have a, a STERI program like Dental for Windows STERI module or something like Scan Care or STERI in stock. And then they've got spots in there that you can actually keep this information. Right. So if you're still feeling overwhelmed or you have some questions, I am here to help. This is something uh, I really love to do. Um, some of you might be feeling, yep, fine, on top of it. Others, you might be thinking I've spoken some foreign language. So please do reach out. Um, I offer a number of services. Um, the first one is um, I've released a couple of online courses, which I'm really proud of. And uh, the first one is a three hour dental infection control mini course for beginners, but basically it's for anyone who's a beginner or even been in the in the game for a while who just wants to review their basics. Um, I've also now released the first module of an autoclave course, just talking about autoclaves and testing and recording shot with Steve Lyons. And what I've tried to do in all these courses is make it for any learning level. So you don't need a university degree. And I've tried to introduce the terminology gradually. So I'm not bamboozling you with all this high tech stuff and give you some you know, pointers that I think are practical and real life. Um, as I said, I also do consulting, accreditation on the side. So if you want to know more, please just head to my website. I have a list here of the references that I've used for tonight's webinar that will be available in the replay. But I try very hard to use the latest uh, standards and guidelines, which range from the ADA to um, the Royal Australasian College of General Practitioners to the Australian New Zealand standards to anything overseas like through the CDC. Right, we've come to this Q&A part and I see there's quite a few questions. So um, let me scroll back to the beginning and see if I can help you here. So if there's any questions, please pop them in now. All right, so I've got a question on the Helix test. Um, someone has said we do this every day, though, is there is some thought that it might only need to be done every week. Ah, so you might be talking about the vacuum test or the leak test which tests the seals of the door and I uh, believe the vacuum pump that's in our um, common type B sterilizers. Um, that is done every day, unless you have a brand that has an air detector fitted and then you do it only once a week. Though some practice have decided that it's too complicated to actually just do it once a week. They're just going to do it routinely every day. They're going to do the leak test followed by their helix test religiously to sort of probably try to remove that human error. And some of the modern autoclaves too, you can preset to come on the night before and run through those tests. So when you come in in the morning, off you go. Now with the helix test uh, of the Bowie Dick, most of you should be running the helix test if you're putting hand pieces through. That is required by the Australian New Zealand Standard 4815 to be done every day. Now it doesn't specify when on the day, but it makes sense to do it first thing in the morning and get all your testing out of the way in my view. But if as a practice you decide that you're going to run your helix test through the day, um, you can. It is only required to be done once a day and doesn't specify when. Uh, can you put a Bowie Dick test and a helix test device in the same test cycle? Well, I would say no, because they're both slightly different tests. One is for porous things in your chamber and perhaps you run porous items. But as my understanding of the helix test is actually the more challenging of the two tests, because what you have to do 
It's a 1500 milliliter millimeter long tube that is incredibly narrow to sort of simulate the inside of dental hand pieces. And it's incredibly hard for that autoclave to suck the air out. And then when the air is out, the steam can then come through, go around and change that indicator. So no, I think that's doubling up and not necessary. Um, I would just probably put the helix test in. We were told the Bowie Dick test had to be run in a hot autoclave. Ah, okay, so the vacuum test must be done in a cold chamber for sure. And Steve Lines goes through that in um, quite a bit of detail in the course, which is really interesting to understand the physics. Um, when it's running the Bowie Dick Helix test, I'm not aware that it has to be hot. The cycle itself will warm up the autoclave. To my knowledge, when I was chatting with Steve, um, who's a bit of a guru when it comes to autoclaves, um, yes, so you can run it straight after your helix test, but check your manufacturer's instructions, see what they do say. And also then check the brand of the helix test, read their instructions as well and see where they line up. Um, one question, is it required that if processing porous loads, then the Bowie dig test is done that day, but the helix test is done daily if you're, ah. Uh, so Ellen, that's pretty much the question um, that I've just answered that um, in my view and from what I've read and from what I understand, you could run a Bowie dig and then you could run a helix, but they need to be done at separate times. But my understanding is your helix is the more challenging load. I would be interested to know too what porous items uh, practices are putting through because it's generally more cost effective to do a lot of single use items when it comes to gowns, sterile gauze and things like that. Of course, that's a decision you make as a practice. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to see there. Uh, right, so we're moving on to ultrasonic cleaners. Do we have to rinse instruments after the ultrasonic with normal tap water or distilled water? OK, so according to the ultrasonic, the Australian, New Zealand, no, Australian standard for ultrasonic cleaners, which I referenced, at the moment in office space, we can use normal tap water. If you wish to use distilled water, you can, or RO water, um, but at the moment you don't have to but they are probably leaning towards best practice too. So for example, if you have a washer disinfector, um, whether it's an above bench or under bench, that final rinse is definitely with um, not good old tap water, but it's um, yeah been properly, it's usually RO water, I think that they put through or a distilled water. Um, Another question, in the last slide, the lid was off on the ultrasonic. When doing my training, we were always taught that running the ultrasonic without the lid was damaging to your hearing. Is this a myth? Ah, so whenever the ultrasonic cleaner is on, yes, you should have the lid on. Whether it's for your hearing, I must admit, I'm not sure about that one, um, but it's more for aerosol management. Um, so if you have dirty instruments inside, you definitely want the lid on and keeping everything contained. Otherwise, you've got this lovely bubbling mix and I'm sure there's lots of splatter and droplets and all sorts of in the air. Be very interesting to do a test on that. Um, and it also does muffle the sound a bit. So yes, general rule is always to keep that lid on when you've got your instruments inside. When you're doing that foil test, when you're testing that performance and it's 10 seconds long and the water is clean, no, you probably wouldn't. Um, if you're doing the pencil test and it's going in, yes, I'd probably put that lid back on for that particular time. Uh, so with that pencil or coin test, um, do we have to run it for a full cycle or just turn it off at the three minute mark? Uh, well, according to the ultrasonic standard, it says it's three minutes. You don't need to run it through a full cycle. Um, 
look at the manufacturer's instructions if you've bought if you've bought the the test kit also see what they what they say for that um hello i'm wondering if there is a recommended size for the foil used in the foil test we found when using a large piece of foil it made a lot of foil particles which created a slow training ultrasonic after a few days <laughs> yeah, i'm not surprised all right, so with the size of the foil, um, back to the ultrasonic standard, the Australian standard, I uh, can't remember the number. Um, it said to use um, two or three strips that were big enough, but won't touch the sides or won't touch the bottom. So they're not huge. It's not like you're, take, you're taking these three pieces and to only run it for 10 seconds, not for like two minutes, which you'll completely obliterate it and you'll have lots of pieces going into that ultrasonic and then trying to drain out the hose. So perhaps have a look. It's only a 10 second time that you actually need to blast, you know, that foil with and you shouldn't have as much falling in. But once again, you need to get stuff falling in uh, and you do need to clean it out which is why I recommend if you're doing that foil test, do it just before you're going to empty it. So when it's a bit dirty, you've used it for the morning, empty it out. Um, there's another question here. So this one um, is talking about batch control identification, which yes, I didn't go into. That's another big topic as well. Um, all right. So batch control identification, this is all about tracking your instruments that are deemed in the category of critical. So it can get a little bit um, confusing. So how I think of it when I talk about um, Spalding's classification and what of the three classifications does your instrument that you're using fit under non-critical, semi-critical and critical. It's basically based on where that instrument is going to go. Like is it just going to go on the patient's head and its safety glasses? Well they're they're still deemed non-critical. If it's going to actually go below the gingiva, cause some bleeding, go into an open cavity, um, they tend to be deemed critical. Now your cavitron tips and your scalars tend to sit in this slightly gray area between, okay, are they semi-critical or do they really delve further down and are they critical? I always err on the side, if you're not sure, go critical and track and, you know, trace or track that particular item. Because if you're not sure, you might as well just make it critical. And what you're doing is you're putting a series of numbers on the, the bag or the wrapped cassette, which says what sterilization cycle that the instrument went through, what sterilizer it was, number one, two or three, and um, the date of the cycle. So we're not we're sort of trying to track back to a cycle. Um, so this is one of those areas where your professional judgment comes in, you know, and it's quite often a discussion that you as a practice should have and go, okay, what are we deeming critical? Is everything going to be deemed critical? If we bag or wrap it, it's critical. Blanket rule, that's what some practices do. Others will say, this is our list of critical instruments. Here they are on the stereo wall, some photos. This is everything that must be bagged and then must have a label attached to it. Um, uh, do I have any experience or comments about sterilization containers as replacement for bags? Uh, no, I don't. I'm not sure what a sterilization container is. Are you talking about like the perforated uh, metal? Um, oh, words escape me. Cassettes. Thank you. Cassettes. Um, or are you talking about something that's like sealed because you can't have something sealed in a steam autoclave because the air has to be got from out from outside from inside and then the steam has to go in you might need to clarify that for me 
Okay, do we have to bag hand pieces? Ha <laughs> ha. Sort of leads back to that question. Is your average slow speed, high speed, semi critical or critical? Surgical hand pieces, well, there's no doubt about that. Used in surgicals, they're deemed critical. But do you have to bag your slow speed and high speed that are used in general restorative? Okay, you only have to bag critical instruments at this point in time according to the Australian New Zealand standards 4815. So you only have to bag your criticals and then when you bag them you've got to label them with a batch control label. It's up to you whether you um, bag your slow speed, high speed hand pieces. Um, whether they're bagged or not they still have to go through the steam steriliser and when they've come out, they still have to be stored appropriately. And that means not loose on the top of a bench. They need to be put away in a drawer, in a cupboard, in a container. They can't be open to the elements. That's one of the requirements of semi-criticals. I hope that helps. Um, I was recently in a practice that barcoded their instruments after sterilization. Should they not be before they go through the sterilizer? Mm. Well, I think ideally we would like them to be, but some particular programs and some particular brands of sterilizers won't produce the barcode labels till after the procedure. And I guess I don't really have an issue with that as long as there's a process in place that people know what they're labeling. So if regardless of 10 bags went in, We've deemed them all critical, even though maybe some are some slow speed hand pieces, and we're just going to label everything that comes out. So the process has to be really clear. The 4815 standard that I'm alluding to was written in 2006. It's old. It's older. It's getting outdated. There's been a lot of improvements since then. So we're awaiting with bated breath us strange infection control people for the new Australian standard, which will be released this year. So they're retiring the 4815. They're also retiring the 4187, which is what hospitals and day procedures. And they're bringing out a new Australian standard with a new number, which will rule everyone and in healthcare and some non-healthcare facilities. So um, yeah, wait for that. It will hopefully have a bit more information about the fact that some barcode labels are only produced after a cycle. Do we need to keep the piece of foil after the foil test? No, you do not. You only need to record the result. However, if you wish to keep it and have zillions of little pieces of foil in your foil, you can. I personally would try to move away from keeping bits of foil and if you want to, you can photograph it. Have an old mobile phone or something in the steri room. Take photographs of this and store it on your computer. Get rid of the paperwork. Get it all electronic. Um, oh, these batch control labels. Can you basically write it by hand or does it have to have a tracking printed label? You can do it by hand. You can do it with um, a barcode. It's up to you how you want to do it. Um, as long as they're the label or as long as what's been written on that bag or that wrap cassette is the important information that is required. You know, it's got the date, the cycle number and the sterilizer number. If you have more than a couple, you've got to have some identifying feature to know which sterilizer you've popped it through. Um, what is the best way to dry the instruments? Ah, so after they've been cleaned, you want to dry them. So the best way um, I think would be a drying cabinet. Fantastic, but yes, that's another piece of equipment to have in a steri room and you need the room for that. Often hospitals will have that. Otherwise you can use, um, you must use a lint free cloth, whether it's a reusable or a disposable. It really needs to be lint free because you don't want to leave bits of lint on your instruments which then go through the steriliser, which then when you open up can go on to patients. So it's really lint free. Um, so it's one of those things, isn't it? You're looking at, I want to save the environment. So can I use reusable lint free cloths? But then you've got to launder them properly. 
do you have a washing machine in your premise or is it easier to use you know the disposable lint free um, towels that you can buy yes so there's basically that's it it's either good old-fashioned manual cleaning like you dry your dishes or a drying cabinet you can look into if we need to go paperless, do we have to store the Helix test for records? Yeah, once again, believe it or not, you don't actually have to store that record, but you have to record that you've cited it and what the result is. Now, let's say you would prefer to keep that, that strip as evidence. Yes, you can stick it to a paper thing or you can take a photo of it and put it into your system. But no, you actually don't have to keep that strip. The reason being is, you know, all these records we're keeping for our Steri room, we should have them probably for about seven years. You need to check with your state, but I think seven years is a really good sort of minimum. I don't think you'll find that that strip will last. It'll probably start to change different color. It's like those receipts that you get, they'll fade with time. So these strips aren't archival quality. So um, yes, you can keep them, but I'd scan it or take a photograph of it as well, or just scan and take a photo of it. What are my thoughts on washer disinfectors? Ha <laughs> ha, the big question. Right, well, at the moment, they're not compulsory. Will they become compulsory with the new Australian Standard 5369 that's coming out for us? Um, I don't know. Um, the people who are on the committee writing this standard unfortunately can't say much. <laughs> uh, we've quite a few of us have asked. So until we know for sure. The thing I will say about washer disinfectors is what I like about them, this is in general, is they clean and dry consistently. We know that um, dental assistants are pumped for time. Everyone cleans differently, whether it's manual cleaning, ultrasonic manual cleaning. Um, we are, some are more thorough than others. We have a bit more time. There's always that risk of sharp injuries. We're under pressure. If you've got a washer disinfector, you basically let that instrument do the washing, the cleaning, the drying for you, which I think is fantastic and it's validated, which means that it's consistently doing the same type of clean every time. Now, the drawbacks for it are um, you need space in your sterilizing room. So if you've got the size of a broom cupboard, it's a bit tricky. If you're looking at renovating or building a new practice, I would definitely look at least putting the space or the electrics or the piping in for it. And if not, you've got a great space for something else. Uh, the cost is a downsize to buy, to run. It uses very acidic and alkaline detergents. Um, you can get top bench ones, under bench ones. And I would like to think there's not a lot on the market, but I would like to think as the push is going towards this more validated, reliable cleaning, that more will come on the market for us that are more suitable for office based. Um, so yes, watch watch this space. Um, are there any requirements, standards for surgery, clinic cleaning protocols, floor cleaners for the vinyl? OK, so when it comes to cleaning the surgery, so let me just sort of say um, you're wanting to clean um, your bench tops and your chair and things like that. This is where we go. You can go to the ADA guidelines and see what it says. And you can also go to the National Health and Medical Research Council. They have this big 500 page infection control guideline document that talks a lot about this. So your normal standard neutral detergent with elbow grease behind it, because you can't just sort of gently touch. You've actually got to put a bit of pressure, elbow grease and actually clean. Uh, works really, really well. Um, if you want to use a disinfectant product, so that's the chemical added, you've got to see if it's compatible with your chair, uh, if it's going to avoid your warranty and yeah, what the chemicals are, what's involved to use it. 
floors and things like that. There's not, there is some guidance in the national uh, NHMRC guidelines uh, that you can look up. Uh, normally it's floor cleaners, floor detergents and elbow grease. That does work really well. Um, all right, how are we going for time? Great, probably give you five more minutes guys and then um, we'll be, I think hopefully at that hour, though we did start a bit late, didn't we? Right, another question. Exam trays, any ideas on bags uh, for using as liners and things like that, freezer bags, bibs to place the instruments? Ah, uh, yes. So if you've got one of those plastic trays that's all indented, um, you might have decided to cover it with glad wrap or plastic freezer bag or something like that to help um, ease the cleaning, cleaning of it because um, it might get a hole or two in it, but when you take the bag off, it's, it appears to be easier to clean. No, I don't particularly have any suggestions other than or standards for that bag. No, it, it just needs to be. I don't see why you couldn't use um, the clear plastic bags that you can buy through any of the dental supply companies. You're really just needing something that's a, um, a barrier if that's what you're choosing to do. But if anyone has any comments on that, please let me know. Um, question about putting too many instruments in a sterilizing bag that's just big enough. Yes. Um, yes, it is for safety reasons. So, and for just purely being able to properly sterilize the instruments in the bag. So it's trying to find the right size bag for that particular amount of instruments. And that can be a little tricky at times because sometimes the bag is just a bit too wide or it's not quite wide enough or just not quite long enough as well. So that's sometimes where you might use um, bags where you can get the rolls and self cut them and self seal them. Um, medical supply companies too, I've been told, often have a bigger selection than the dental supply companies when it comes to those pre-sized sterilization bags. So try that, see how you go. Yes, so there is that uh, safety issue. You're shoving more in, something's going to pop through that paper and you need them to lay flat and have that finger width on either side so that when they're in this autoclave, the steam coats the instruments evenly and sterilizes them evenly as well. Um, yep. Yes, so Ellen said something about the tray covers might need to be TGA approved. Yeah, they might need to be, Ellen. You know what? I'm not 100% sure on that because it's just a tray cover. I'm. It's not like it's a medical device. So I don't know if it needs to be. Um, you might, perhaps it needs to be of a certain quality so that it doesn't stretch or pierce easily. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. But yeah, remind me, Ellen, I, I'll look into that for you. That's great. Now this presentation has been recorded, so the recording, if my technology worked, will be sent to you tomorrow in an email and you can rewatch it at your leisure. Um, if a few more minutes, is there any other last minute questions that anyone would like to ask? Well, I'm getting lots of thank you, so thank you very much for being here with me tonight. Um, yeah, thanks for spending your time as well, Julia. Thank you. Oh, Julie, sorry. I've got my glasses on too. And I think next time I do this, I might have an offsider to help me <laughs> manage all of this. Um, I've certainly had a lot of questions, which has been uh, lovely. Oh, thanks, Karen. Thank you very much for that. All right, everyone, um, get on with your evening. Um, have a nice time. Check out uh, my courses on my website and of course I'm available. Um, I do offer a 30 minute complimentary call if you want to chat to me about things. Yeah, go on with that. All right, so I'll say good night now and um, hope to see you at my next webinar. Bye everyone.